Welcome to Educational Alpha. I'm Bill Kelly, CEO of Kai Association and your host, bringing you on the ground conversations with business leaders, educators, and industry colleagues from around the globe. Educational Alpha is sponsored by iCapital, the financial technology company with the mission to power the world's alternative investment marketplace. Part innovator, part educator, and part navigator of the alternatives industry, iCapital offers intuitive, scalable digital solutions that have transformed how private market and hedge fund investments are bought and sold. With iCapital, financial advisors, wealth managers, and asset managers around the world now have access to everything they need to deliver the return and diversification potential of alternatives to high net worth investors. To learn more, visit iCapital.com. In today's installment, we have special guest, Jacob Miller, the co-founder of Opto Investments, joining us to delve into the fascinating world of private markets. Throughout the episode, we explore Opto Investments' approach, which focuses on providing diversified access to beta and identifying capital partners that offer differentiated opportunities. With a strong belief in the crucial role of Registered Investment Advisors, RIAs, Jacob highlights the importance of prescribing suitable remedies for clients' retirement goals and capital while sharing his insights from the selection of top managers to the growing importance of education and long-term investments. Listen in. Jacob Miller, welcome to Educational Alpha. Thank you. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. I was in your New York office where I think we met briefly. I was working with some of your colleagues on some educational videos, which I enjoyed a lot. I respect any platform that puts education near and dear to the missions. So I did enjoy that. And we're going to talk a lot about what's happening in this democratization space and maybe a very difficult and different role the RIA community faces. And I think that's right in the wheelhouse of Opto Investments. But before we get into that, maybe a little bit of your background. I know you're a founder of Opto, but maybe what led up to this next chapter in your life? Yeah. So I founded Opto three years ago with Joe Lonsdale, who's founder of Palantir, Adapar, APC, and a number of other platform technology companies and a bunch of fintech. So it was a great experience there. I've been an investor my whole life, really. I grew up in San Francisco, was coming into cognizance during the dot-com boom and bust, saw our next-door neighbor go from driving a beat-up old Honda to a Ferrari, back to a beat-up old Honda over the span of about 18 months, and thought, that looks like a fun game. I should figure out how to play it better. So I've been active in markets since I was about eight, eight years old. By the time I got to college, I was managing money for friends and families, particularly in commodities, bonds, and currencies. Was writing about that, ended up getting in contact with some of the folks at Bridgewater through that, and spent the first portion of my career as an investor there. Working with our clients on a lot of the same questions that we do today with RIAs, and then also specializing in risky credit, so emerging market debt, high yield corporate. Saw from that vantage point how important private credit was and private markets in general were to the economy and got fascinated with founding something that would bring broader access to the space. So a couple of maybe just additive points before we get into what you're doing now. I don't know if this was on Opto Investments website or someplace else, but I saw you were described as a certified market junkie, and maybe you answered the question in terms of your background, having run money for friends and family at a very young age. But was your dad in this business, or was it the neighbor with the Ferrari? What prompted you to take this on? Because usually at eight years old, you want to be a cop or a fireman, but very few people say, I want to run an investment platform. Yeah. So everyone in my family besides me basically is a lawyer. So didn't actually grow up that steeped in investment. Did do a lot of argumentation. You know, we're from a family of Jewish lawyers, so a lot of debate about the Talmud and the Torah and the law. And I think that debater's mindset and trying to be right and find the best argument and find truth was actually instrumental in that, where from an early age, I saw markets as just a really fun game. And now they get more serious than that. And I take the fiduciary side of this very seriously, but there are very few professions where you can test your ideas that quickly. And so having this feedback mechanism of learning, thinking, hypothesizing, being wrong or right, getting kicked in the gut or doing well, either way, you learn something. And it just led to such a fast learning curve that from a young age, that sort of 
that was a lot of fun. And I got to learn a lot about a lot of things, maybe a little bit, a lot of things, but I will say there's a couple phrases in our language that we've cut down and they actually mean the opposite of what they originally meant. Jack of all trades, master of none. The full phrase was Jack of all trades, master of none. Surely that's better than master of one. Markets to me were a way to get to dabble in every interest you can think of and always bring it back to this testable, repeatable process of learning. And maybe another proverb to throw on top of that is the old Chinese one, may you live in interesting times. And and I think some people that don't really understand what that means thinks it's a positive statement when it's really quite the opposite. And if I'm an investor of any stripe, I'm living in interesting times right now. And we all saw what happened at the 60-40 last year. This coincided with a dramatic move toward democratization full stop. And I think a lot of RIAs are saying, well, maybe it's not broke in the 60-40. And we've seen this year, there's been less correlation and the 10-year crossed the 5% mark for the first time in almost two decades. And I don't know what the Fed did today or tomorrow, but it seems like rates are going to be higher for longer. So the 60-40 may still work, but we've talked to this platform about a capital formation value creation in equities is happening in the private markets. And there's a lot of data to back that up. And then Thanks to Messrs. Dodd and Frank, banks don't necessarily lend anymore. So the home lending really is in the private markets as well. So if we're responsible for our own retirement, we have to have greater access. And, and I think maybe some of that was the genesis a couple of years ago of creating Opto Investments. But maybe talk about the thought about why you did this in the first place. You could argue that sort of these tech innovators, it's gotten to be a crowded space, but there aren't that many of them. And democratization could represent an 80 to $100 trillion play just by this generational move of capital, put aside new investors coming in. So there's plenty of room for competition. So what prompted this in the first place? And maybe as a follow-up, Jacob, how do you look at your model and do you differentiate it from other models that are out there in the marketplace today? Yeah, of course. So we see this as a large secular trend for a few reasons. So you mentioned a couple of them. One, large generational wealth transfer from G1 to G2 and G3 and beyond. Those later generations are much more likely to have had some exposure to private asset classes, be that through options in their companies. They work at private equity firms, whatever the case may be, and are looking for that and what their RA can bring to them. Second is this secular macro shift of if there is enough capital on the long-term investment side, why would I go public? Why would I increase my cost, increase regulatory scrutiny? And so companies staying private for longer, tapping private versus public debt sources, more value being accreted in private equity than on the public side. And then lastly, you have a technological shift where this has been historically a very difficult paper-based, fax-based process that wasn't super scalable across clients and would have been hard for a small practice to add in a robust way. All three of those things have been combining to make this really right place, right time thing, we think, and we're seeing an adoption. As you noted, there's probably trillions of dollars to shift here. The average family office is over 50% in privates, endowments in the 30, 40% range. The average RIA is closer to 2%. And maybe given the net worth of the clients, the number is not 50, but it's probably not two either. We think somewhere in that 15 to 20% range for qualified purchasers makes sense, given liquidity needs. The gap we saw in the market to differentiation was the existing toolkits platforms being built for, by and large, people who kind of knew what they wanted and so more of a supermarket. If I'm a five-star Michelin chef, I can walk in, buy the ingredients I need, go home and cook them. If I'm new to this space, or even if I just don't have the time to be a full-time CIO for privates, how do I find the right partnership and make sure that this is the right thing to be eating for my diet, for my health? And so we see our role as partners, not product providers. I think that's a big differentiator versus some of the other folks in the space. And in that also tend to focus a little bit more on the alpha side of things than beta. And what I mean by that is private markets are a large asset class now. And it realistically makes sense, even if you're thinking 60-40, to have diversified access to beta. So you have some private equity exposure and some public equity exposure, some private debt and public debt. You don't need to think that that's going to outperform markets for it to still be additive from a correlation return perspective. But as capital partners and as ones who are aligned, because we're risking our capital alongside clients in many cases, we are serving as the advisor to their mandates. Our goal is really to find the best of the best. Now, 
Are we going to do that every single time? Who knows? But we try and find those capital partners who are oversubscribed, who are offering something really differentiated that if it works out, will be highly different from a traditional market exposure. And I think you said as much, Jacob, but to be clear on my side, your client is the RIA, not the ultimate asset owner who might be the high net worth individual, correct? Yeah, we think the RIA has a pivotal, pivotal role to play in the same way as you want a doctor to prescribe medications. You want the financial doctor to prescribe the remedies for your retirement goals and what you want to do with your capital. And so we see a lot of these technology shifts in terms of AI and what we're doing here with as augmentations, but not in any way, shape, or form replacements of that human element, where you still want that fiduciary who's on the client's side, knows them and their financial goals and future better than anyone else, and then now just has a broader toolkit to draw upon and tools to help make utilizing that toolkit as seamless as possible. So if I'm an RIA and I come to you, is it an a la carte approach or is it a fund-to-fund approach or a little bit of both or something else? I'll go back to it's partnership, not product. And so we're not here to sell any one thing. We're here to say, you probably haven't explored all the ways that private markets could help your client. Let's find the right fit for your practice and your book of work. In some cases, that is a la carte options where we'll bring 10 to 12 best ideas a quarter. It's not hundreds. It's in the low dozens range that they can access at low minimums where we've committed an institutionally sized check so we can get access to oversubscribed things and make that addressable to a smaller check size. More common though, is our clients building their own custom exposures. And so saying, I really want to do private markets holistically. Let me build the growth portfolio or the income portfolio or the balance portfolio that can be across five, seven, 10 managers plus co-investments and give people a diversified foothold in private so that for hundred K a client could get access to a dozen opportunities. And then build that out over time for maximum diversification at digestible sizes for a robust exposure. So that latter description then, Jacob, that would be in a fund-to-fund structure? Yeah, it would just be a customized fund-to-fund. So we're not building that across every client. We're sitting down with the CIO of a practice and saying, no one knows your clients better than you. We're not going to sell you something off the shelf. Let's talk about what mix of assets, what type of managers, what type of deals best matches your firm's investment philosophy, and let's build that directly for you. And then build white-labeled software around that so that it can learn about your clients in the way that you think about it, match your business practices, and be seamless for your advisors to implement. So, so much of the discussion sometimes in our industry, and this is at the institutional level as well, I think we have the tendency to sometimes look at fees only. And I look at fees relative to return, relative to the underlying manager, relative to access, to manager selection, et cetera, et cetera. And all those things matter. And when I think about a fund of fund structure, you could very easily say, well, there's a couple layer of fees and you may have a different model there. But all that being said, you are doing the due diligence and you are handling the diversification play and the ongoing due diligence about what manager stays and doesn't stay in that platform. And if I'm a relatively small RIA size client, my ability to get access to these managers, let alone the ability to do diligence, is challenged at best. And if you think about the origin of how a lot of institutions, maybe on the smaller to medium size access alts in the early days, it was through a fund-to-fund structure because they did not have the infrastructure or the relationships on the consultant side to do that due diligence. So I think it's an interesting approach. I don't know if that is being done by some of the competition, but but I think it's important to look at the totality of what that means as opposed to sometimes people just hear fund of funds and think, well, fees. Yeah. And I think it's particularly important in private markets where as an example, in public markets, if I take the universe of hedge funds that use this, the S&P 500 as a benchmark, and so they're a long, short manager on the S&P, the differential between top and bottom quartile, depending on the year, is between 4 and 6%. Great if you can earn 6% above market, but that's not a huge amount in absolute terms. The difference between top and bottom quartile venture capital is more like 25%. And so manager selection is so much more important in private markets for logical reasons. I have a very simple framework for what drives our performance. You can have unique information, unique access, unique insight, or you can get lucky. And the first two are illegal in public markets. That's insider trading. So it all comes down to insight and you hope you have some luck. 
the lifeblood of private markets is that access and information. It makes our performance much more repeatable because those networks and information flows tend to last. It's not forever, but fund over fund, there's high autocorrelation. That also makes it harder to access the best things because people know what they are and they get oversubscribed quickly. And it means that if you're being sold something really actively, it may not be the best thing because there's an adverse selection there. And so we try and turn that on its head by, it's not a fund of funds in the traditional sense where like we're just saying, this is our best ideas, take it or leave it. We're going to set up a few dozen top relationships that we would put our own family's capital in, and in most cases are, and make that available for a collaborative partnership of assembling the right subset of that for clients. And they can also bring managers that they might have worked with before into that mix. And so they can build a custom fund that might be two or three deals that they love. It's someone they've worked with for a decade. They don't want to stop doing that. They do want it to get easier, augmented with five, six, seven things that we can bring at lower minimums than they could otherwise find with full diligence included and ongoing lifecycle management. Makes great sense. So in terms of your platform and demand, as you probably do, Jacob, I travel a lot. I go to a lot of conferences, speak to a lot of members around the world. And and if I think about 2021 and the years leading up to maybe Q3 2021, private equity, private equity, private equity, and venture too, across the private equity spectrum. And then this year, private debt is in overdrive. And rightly or wrongly, we could talk a little bit about this too, the hedge fund gets tucked in in the wheel well of the bus and gets run over a couple of times for good measure, which I don't necessarily agree with. We could talk about that more as well. And then maybe natural resources as a commodity, as a hedge against inflation gets tucked in there sometimes. And then nobody really talks about infrastructure to a very large degree. So those are generalizations, but where are you seeing the demand? And it's demand reasonably well correlated with opportunity in your mindset. Yeah, that's a rich question. I'd say demand and opportunity are related, but not necessarily always correlated. And it's interesting how I think we all have a cognitive bias that as we become stronger practitioners, we try and unlearn, but it's still there. When equities go up, we're like, Ooh, I want to catch that. Like, is that going to keep going up? How do I participate? When the yields go up and the same, like that's when people get more excited versus them selling down. And so you get, depending on how things are quoted and how people think about performance, you get different cognitive biases, different recency bias. And so in some markets, you definitely get, I think, some anti-correlation between demand and opportunity. Venture is a great example there. If you're reading about a 30X IPO, it may be not the best time to be deploying because the founders will have the buying power versus the investors. A great time is when that's falling apart and they will take whatever capital they can get. Now, hopefully they're still working with great VCs who are good stewards and help those companies. But overall excitement is probably inversely correlated to the attractiveness of that entry point. Debt can be different because for a positive debt atmosphere, you definitely need overall healthy levels of activity. If you're the only lender, companies are going to start failing because everyone needs loans and if companies start failing, probably revenue of the company you're lending to is going to be impacted. So you definitely need open enough financial conditions. That said, with the interest in private debt this year, what we're looking at is how do you split out the equity-like risk from the income and debt-like risk and make sure that you're getting compensated fairly? It's okay to take equity-like risk in a fixed income instrument, but you just need to be compensated for it. And so with that much interest going in, driving yields down in some places, you know, we work with clients to make sure, especially on those broader semi-liquid sort of issues in the debt space, that they're getting the requisite compensation they should be asking for. And if not, where they could look, where maybe those yields are more aligned with the overall level of risk. So a couple of follow-ups there. So it seems like we are talking about as an industry, private credit, full stop. And I think we look at EBITDA multiples, but the bottom line cash flow has to have debt service with a much higher coupon now. And I don't think a lot of business models are growing at the same rate of interest rates. So I think it's gotten more expensive and we are going to see, I think some things break, hopefully the right due diligence has been done, but I think we're going to see some breakage. I think having a a workout team is going to be critically important. Underwriting is going to be critically important. But then if I look at the other side of this too, that I'm thinking about 2023 is maybe a good vintage year for private equity, potentially, given what's gone on from a valuation standpoint. And I've got to have a 
pretty selective and thoughtful GP, but it also maybe tied into that the secondary space. And this denominator effect was on the tips of everybody's tongues not that long ago. And the secondary market now became much less of a distressed place. So do you travel in secondaries? And what are your views on the current vintage year for private equity in 2023? Yeah, why don't we start with that broader question, and then I'll get into secondaries. Something you and I have talked about before, and you talked about with Opto, and we couldn't agree with more, and you articulated, but then we have like, this is a whole ecosystem in and of itself. But you can say, am I bullish or bearish on equities overall? But much more nuanced is what sectors, where are we in the cycle? Do I want to be in discretionary, staples, energy? Like it's a universe unto itself. And when we think about a year like today, we do think there's more opportunity than there has been in a few years in private equity. But where we are really focused is on specialists. And what I mean by that is, how do you win a deal in an up market? You write the biggest check at the highest valuation. When capital starts pulling back, it becomes much more about what's the operating history of this team? Have they helped companies like mine through periods like this? As the cost of capital rises, as you note on the debt side, how are these capital partners going to support my firm and get me to the other side? And so specialists with that really deep industry expertise and ability to drive efficiency and be a stopgap during tough periods start to win deals at better valuations in super high quality companies. And so we like specialists, we like people with I wouldn't call it distress. These aren't distressed companies, but it is sort of, look, it's higher cost of capital management. How do I move through a period where, as you noted, growth might be lower than the interest rate? That's not something that happens super frequently in real space. It does happen in nominal space, and it's hard for companies. Having teams and backers that know how to get through that leads to a better outcome for the company, but really interesting entry points for the investors. So we are very focused there, particularly in financials and technology, where you've had the biggest dislocations this year. That also means the biggest opportunities for people who constructively add value. Now, on to secondaries, it is always going to be an interesting space. As you said earlier, they may live in interesting times. There probably hasn't been a time where secondaries were boring in some way, shape, or form. The denominator effect, which is just, hey, there's people who have a policy limit. I only get to hold 30% private equity. If public equities fall that 30% number goes up and I now become a fourth seller. I have to go to secondary buyers. A lot of the air in that balloon has left. That was a large rebalancing that had to happen early to mid this year. And as equity performance has gotten a little bit more stable, that's less acute, but it's definitely still there. There's a couple of reasons you could want to do secondaries. One is it can cut the time horizon of a fund exposure down. And so rather than an eight-year fund with being in the J-curve for three years, you can be jumping in year four and have a little bit more certainty about on those cash flows are coming. The other I actually think about more is like you need to have a view that this manager has unique access or information in secondaries that others don't. And there's an alpha component to this. I saw this a lot when I was training young investors at Bridgewater. They'd learn about options and they'd be like, ah, I got to put everything on an options. Options are so cool and interesting. I always had a very simple question. It's like, oh, why do you think the volatility is mispriced? Like, what do you mean? It's like, well, if you're trading the option instead of the underlying, you better think the volatility is mispriced. Otherwise, it's just by the underlying. And so people can get kind of wrapped up in like the story behind it. But you should think either there's a practical reason my client needs a shorter fund horizon. I like the exposure, but I want to cut the J curve and give up probably a little bit of upside for doing so. Or I found a secondaries manager who can add alpha through accessing via secondaries versus going direct. If either one of those things is true, it's an awesome space to explore and It's growing and there's great partners across different sectors, but it can be easy to get caught up in a very interesting story, but you still need to trust the underlying exposure. And maybe to complete the full cycle, we can maybe leave infrastructure behind for the moment. But what about the lowly, poor, misunderstood hedge fund? And if I'm thinking about an RIA, and I think about this myself, and maybe the certified market junkie in you, Jacob, thinks about this too. What am I most worried about? Volatility and drawdown risk. And what is my very best chance for managing that? I think it's hedging. And I don't know if that's the same as a hedged fund, but there might be time perhaps to be thinking about more accessing some kind of a beta control to maybe dampen down the volatility, keep me fully invested. So what is maybe your mindset as an investor and how is Opto or the RIA space thinking about hedge funds? Are they thinking about them as this asset class, which is the wrong way to think about it versus 
doing homework and try to find the right solutions to fit maybe a portfolio need around risk management. Another very rich question. I think we can go to the history here. Why are they even called hedge funds? I don't know if this is totally apocryphal or not, but the idea early on was people would have views on an equity. I might like Ford. They might not have views on overall economic growth. How do I isolate that view, that alpha position? Well, I should go long Ford and short either an index of automakers or short a specific automaker to hedge out is one risk, which is how many dollars spent on cars a year. Maybe I don't have a view on that. So I'm going to hedge that and just take a view on Ford as a better company in the competition. So that's where the hedge piece comes in. And in that simple example or examples like that, it should limit the amount of market risk I'm getting. What it also does is it means I'm isolated in skill risk. Like that person better be right about Ford versus the competition. There's a reason to think all automakers through time should go up. That's just the risk premium being paid to me by people who are risking capital. Unless I think that person is really exceptional, there's no reason why they should be right more often than flipping a coin. Fast forward to today, hedge funds can mean so many things from algorithmic trading, CTAs, managed futures, long short equity, long only equity. And it really, like you said, becomes about looking at what your portfolio needs. And so if you're overweight equity risk, a long only equity manager isn't going to help with that. A short only equity manager might, but short only is really hard. And so you better think that person's really good. More easy to access and conceptually, I would say, is we just think about in terms of what are the factors that are going to influence this portfolio? Growth, inflation, discount rates, risk premiums. Looking at where I'm concentrated there and thinking about which ways of applying thought to markets might mitigate those while not reducing my risk premium. And so if I have a traditional 60-40 portfolio, I am probably underweight things that outperform in periods of rising inflation, like commodities, IL bonds. If there was a hedge fund that was long only in the energy equity space or in MLPs or uh, related activity, that might be a very productive, we could call it a hedge. It's an inflation hedge. It's not technically a hedge, but it is going to benefit my portfolio and help me rebalance in a constructive way if the market's not operating in a way that is helpful to my traditional assets. And that can be found in totally public instruments with someone with the right skill. We think that private markets offer a great access point because one of the big things you can't diversify away from is the shared investor base. And so if markets go down, everyone has to rebalance. There's a amount of psychology and panic selling on good assets and bad alike. These are long-term instruments that people are locked into. That can help look through a lot of the tighter, more reflexive pain points that happen in public markets, diversify your investor base, and limit the amount of what I'd call, maybe too poetically, like risk premium contagion that can end up hitting all public markets but can't flow through to private because of the way that they operate. And so can provide a constructive hedge to some of those left tail scenarios in a lot of cases, regardless of which type of asset you're talking about. So one follow up, and then in the remaining minutes we have, I want to touch upon liquidity to Jacob. So the follow up, and I won't name names, although I don't think a Chatham House rules in play, but I heard a consensus amongst a couple of very smart consultants about accessing hedge funds in this market. And one of the laments was that all the good hedge funds are closed. And I'm thinking, huh, when did we stop minting investment talent? So there's got to be emerging managers out there that maybe don't have all the infrastructure, maybe not the length of track record, but the big ones that are closed didn't one day either. And I think the lament you hear from some of the big public pension plans is accessing these managers, maybe they're too large for the ticket size, but also maybe less said publicly, but a reality, the career risk. And if you accept a Bridgewater as a GP, even if the numbers are not so great for a particular quarter, nobody's going to fire you versus a smaller manager nobody's heard of before. So what are your views, both maybe given your experience and then maybe on the Opto platform about how does an emerging manager establish street cred? Because that is the future. And I think that all things being equal, I'd love to get your opinion on this as well, is the larger these managers get, I think all else equal, it's harder to add alpha because they can't tack in and out of the inefficient parts of the market. So I guess the question is your view on emerging markets and how it fits into the platform in an RIA space. Yeah. So 
we share your view that in general size is not your friend when you're looking for alpha and differentiation. I mean, you can set up a logical extreme to this of like, if I am the market, of course, I'm not differentiated. It's the bigger I get, the more the market I am, the harder it is to be different. That said, I think it's sort of like a very left tilted bell curve where like, I need to have enough capital under management that I have the resources that I need to do the research and get the access. And I'd say on the pure public side, it's just really hard. I lived this life for almost five years. Bridgewater has some of the smartest investors on earth, and you are every day competing with the leakage of information, other people learning your strategies. You don't just need to be smarter. You need to be getting smarter faster than everyone else. And so I do think a lot of the best funds are closed. A lot of them are probably too big. And that it's really hard for someone to start a new public hedge fund without the infrastructure, data, traders, market access, and other things that their incumbent competitors might have. It's not impossible. But hard. And you see more sort of interesting emerging market managers coming out of areas that are a little less traffic. So less in long short equity, more in commodity liquidity management, diffing physical for delivery versus futures and understanding storage really well. Like there's definitely room there to just be a utility player and know it better than the next person. Private markets, I think, are different. You get a lot more well trafficked emerging managers and privates. And it's a lot more understandable if someone was a killer, had a great track record at a private equity shop, that it wouldn't be that hard for them to recreate that externally. So they could spin out many times with the blessing of that firm, that a lot of times that private equity firm will be a, a seed investor in that new fund and understand that, look, they're just going to repeat that process. I mean, I'll tell you, if you'd said that after I left Bridgewater, just keep doing what you're doing. I couldn't have. I needed the infrastructure of the data we had, the engineering resources we had, the trading team, account management. I kept investing, but I couldn't have done my Bridgewater job, whereas a private equity manager, venture, even private credit can take their relationships, their knowledge of the market, their footprint, and recreate that much more easily. And so there will be a new vanguard of hedge funds. They are probably going to be harder to spot than the next rung of great venture, private equity, and private credit managers, who you can see with great track records spinning out of great shops, but taking a slightly new approach or a more dedicated approach to what worked for them there. The last thing I'll say on this is the private markets tend to be much more mutually accretive than the public side. Like public hedge funds, it's all about secrecy. Because if you know my trade, you can go against me, try and stop me out, make me force sell. In the private markets, often I want as many people participating as possible. If I say, I think this is the best venture company, I would like other venture capitalists to think that too and invest too. And we all support this company through to maturity. And so spinning out of a firm... In the hedge fund world, you could be under a three-year non-compete and they'll never work with you again. Much more common in private world for that firm to actually support you in that, help you get your early investors, help you get a GP stake. And then, you know, if it's a big venture firm, maybe use you as one of their seed partners. If it's a private equity firm, use you as a specialist in that area. I find that a lot of fun to be more collaborative and a little bit less competitive and secretive on that investment side. And it helps create a richer community of new and earlier managers. And I think implicit in what you just said, Jacob, is one of my early mentors used to say the barriers to entry in this industry are very low. Back then, you needed a Bloomberg, maybe a fact set, and off you go. And, and I guess that's still true to some degree, but you need balance sheet, you need technology, you need risk management, and, and these have become table stakes, and you need to be pretty well capitalized just to get that first dollar in the door. And then you have to have a process that's sustainable, repeatable, and, and not stealable, I guess. I probably subscribe to the weak form of the efficient markets hypothesis, but not overall. I think there are inefficiencies. But as markets develop, those get tighter, those get shorter in time, and those require more balance sheet to close. And so whereas before, like there were moments in the 70s where bonds and equities just didn't agree. Like you could go long one and short the other, and you are almost guaranteed to make money. You don't see many arbitrage conditions like that anymore. If you really know markets, you understand flows, this commodity firm is going to hedge here, and it's going to be a week till this pension fund rehedges, and I can capture that. Like That is real alpha. It just takes months of research to track those flows, understand them, implement them, make sure no one else knows about them. The barriers to entry are still low for just getting started, but for being good, they keep getting higher. Yeah, and the markets are getting more and more efficient every single day, and chat GPT is just warming up. So maybe the last piece, Jacob, to close with is your views on 
liquidity or illiquidity. And I think as RIAs try to educate their client base on diversifying away from the very traditional markets, you are taking illiquidity risk. But I think you also have to wrap that in the fact that capital formation and value creation is happening in the private markets. So you can be in sort of a low to no growth public equity market. And I think a lot of the upside is now witnessed in the private market. So do the RIAs and then maybe ultimately their clients understand the reasons why these markets are less liquid. And I think we have a tendency to try to create structures around interval funds or or other back doors or side windows to give them some liquidity, but then you run into a B-REIT situation and funds have to gate and B-REIT seem to bounce back quite well. But have we done a good enough job of educating the ultimate end investor as to why some portion of that portfolio should be perhaps put into longer-term investments because that money does not have to be accessed for decades or maybe it's next-generation money? Yeah, so it's a few levels. Of, so first, I'd say maybe we'll hit the growth of these sort of semi-liquid structures first. Look, economics is the dismal science. You don't get something for nothing. There's no way to make something that is fundamentally illiquid, fundamentally liquid. It comes with trade-offs. That's usually either cash drag, where you maintain a high portion of cash in that portfolio to meet withdrawals, or counterparty risk, where if everyone wants to leave the structure at the same time, there's going to be blockers to that, and something you thought was liquid will be illiquid. That doesn't mean they don't play a role for certain investors. But what we usually start with is let's understand your client and think about what is their illiquidity budget. If, as you're stating, we're talking about generational wealth, even if we're talking about someone in their 50s planning for how they're going to be spending in their 70s and 80s, that's more than a long enough time horizon to be involved in private markets. And in many ways can actually prevent some bad human behavior as a forced selling, overusing certain types of assets to have that capital locked up. It could be well aligned with your goals financially and help build healthier portfolios. Once you understand what that illiquidity budget is, making sure you pencil out like more than enough that you're not going to be a forced seller, but you're usually left with some portion that you can afford to lock up for five, seven, 10 years. Our view would be maximize that. Find the best that you can find with illiquidity, which usually comes in you know, traditional drawdown structures. Now, why is this? I'll make a Broad generalization here, all assets besides short-term cash and commercial paper are long-term. And equity is an infinite horizon asset. You just happen to be able to get liquidity on it on a daily basis. That said, whoever you're selling it to is thinking about the next period, and they're thinking about the next period. You're doing a long-term calculation implicitly. Private markets are just making that explicit. I'm going to hold this company through a market cycle. I'm going to help this management team make it excellent, and then I'm going to sell it at a higher price. The time horizon that economic changes happen tends to be in the three to seven year range. Funds tend to map to that fundamental reality of boots in the ground. How long does it take to build a building to lower the vacancy, to turn it into a profitable investment? Ditto a startup a little bit longer. Ditto a private equity company somewhere in between the two. And so in some ways, you're actually reducing risk. We talk about illiquidity risk. I'd push back on that and say, yes, it's a liquid. Is that a risk? If you still have the cash to meet your goals, then you're actually reducing risk because now there's no mismatch between the time horizon of that investment and the time horizon of the underlying exposure. Very thoughtful analysis. So you could probably do a whole nother segment on that and maybe I'll have you back, Jacob. But last thing before I let you go, my friend and former colleague, Kristen Fox, put us together and I know she's now doing some work with Opto Investments and I thank her for having brokered this conversation. I learned a lot and look forward to hearing more about greater access, which I think is ultimately what we have to achieve for better outcomes for all retirees or wannabe retirees out there. So Jacob, thanks for your time and for your insights. Absolutely. And yeah, Kristen is the best and I'm greatly appreciative of this. And it's important to our society that everyone can participate where the value is being created at the best of capitalism. Thanks, Jacob. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Educational Alpha. I'm your host, Bill Kelly. Learn more about the Kaya Association and subscribe to the show at kaya.org. That's C-A-I-A.org. See you next time.